Welcome to Level with Emily Reese. This is music by Max LL for the game Spiritfarer from Thunder Lotus Games. As you may know, I tend to lean toward playing games where I can shoot something or maybe set something alight with magic or something like that. Uh, this is not what happens in Spiritfarer, not even a little. Uh, but I fell in love with this game, even though it actually sometimes made me almost too sad in such problematic times that we're in right now. But it was and remains to be such a meaningful experience playing this game. Uh, anyway, as I said, Spiritfarer, made by Thunder Lotus Games, they're in Montreal, in Quebec, in Canada. I started talking to Max initially about how he got connected with that studio, Thunder Lotus Games, because he's done the music for all three of their games. It's actually pretty simple. Um, the founder of the company, Thunder Lotus Games, William Dubé, Will, um, we used to play in a metal band together back in high school. This is, in a way, how we both discovered and started loving music. Uh, we were playing, you know, Metallica covers. We also loved progressive metal and progressive rock. Um, and this is how we got into music. That was around 2003, 2004, 2005. So and then through high school and also through what we call CJEP here uh, in Canada, mm. which is two years you have after high school before university. Um, so we played music together mm. and William went on to pursue um, what I think is a bachelor in digital arts uh, at Concordia University in Montreal. And I went on to pursue, you know, business school, which is not related to music at all. But <laughs> yeah, at some point I went to business school for three years and completed a bachelor. And William started working in the video game industry for another company. And I was starting a little bit my music career and playing live shows and stuff like that. Uh, we played together uh, for a few years as well uh, during for, for live shows. He, Will, William is a drummer. Okay. I'm a guitarist and singer. At that point, I was singing and playing guitar. And after leaving the company uh, he was working for, he decided to start his own game studio and decided to fund his first game on Kickstarter, which ended up being Jotun or Jotun. And he needed someone to make the music. And I had been composing for picture um, for a few years at that point, maybe a year or two. Um, and, you know, I joined the project. I was thrilled to work with him. Uh, for something like that. And that's how the collaboration got started. So uh, high school friends. <laughs> it's fantastic. So how did you yeah. make the jump from business to film scoring, that, which then got you into you know, video game scoring? Well, um, that's, I don't know. The, the question is, might sound simple, but it, you know, the whole interior dialogue that I had uh, with myself is a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd say what sparked the jump is, um, you know, I started traveling extensively uh, around 2010 when I ended my bachelor's degree. And it made me realize a lot of things because when you're far from your own home, uh, from your own society and the way things work in your own society, you sort of gain perspective on a lot of things. And you realize, you know, sometimes it makes you realize this is what I, I must do. This is what I have to do. Otherwise... I won't be happy, you know. I probably won't be happy if I make anything else than music. And I had been, you know, really passionate about music for since I was in in high school. Uh, and you know, I started composing very early when I first started learning the guitar. I had the inst well, instinctively, I wanted to start composing right away. Mm -hmm. Of course, you start learning other songs, but I I felt really attracted to the idea of creating your own sonic worlds and your own songs. And I went to business school because that, you know, I came from a sort of an environment where everyone was either becoming an engineer, a doctor, um, a teacher, 
uh, you know, more classic type liberal professions. And since I wasn't 100% sure of what I wanted to do, a lot of people were pursuing business school around me. And I thought, you know, that might be a more sort of general way of, um, you know, training yourself to be able to enter the world, um, you know, and start a business what in whatever field that might be. And for a while I was thinking of, you know, starting a business in the music industry. But after traveling extensively and making, you know, really realizing a lot of things about my own life and about society in general, I thought, you know, I won't be happy if I'm, I'm in the business of music if I'm not writing music, you know? Mm, yeah. So, yeah, a lot of that led to the decision of like, okay, I'll start writing my own music. I, cre- I started creating my own albums, but as well, like, because I was, you know, I was fascinated by films since a very early age, I thought, and, you know, deeply in love with film music, a lot of film scores, I thought, okay, I want to try exploring that aspect as well. And that led me to pursue some opportunities and in, in scoring and led me to make my first score uh, for a feature film, for a documentary film. And then, you know, one thing led to the next and I was working sort of a, as a composer in the film and the video game industry. That's incredible. And so fast forward to now, the reason we're talking is um, because of Spirit Fair and uh, just a beautiful, beautiful score from you. So just, I mean, I guess kudos for writing such beautiful music and um, so well thought out. And Thank you. I love how themes come in and out and are used in different ways and used in unique kind of ways in different times and set differently across the bar line. It's really fun to to hear how the music kind of unfolds as you progress through this very beautiful game. So before we even talk about the music, can you just describe the game uh, first? Yeah, well, Spirit Fair is, um, is a very unique game because it tries to deal uh, with the subject matter of death and passing and legacy heritage. Um in a, in a way that they describe as cozy and familiar and fun and heartwarming. So basically, I think the idea that sparked Spirit Fair at first was that, you know, death is something that's very common in our society. Well, very common. Everyone goes through, you know, the, the process of having someone they know uh, pass away or you yourself being exposed to the idea of death and confronted to your own mortality. But... It's it's off. It often is a taboo subject, and it's something that's you know so familiar, and you know we don't talk about it a lot. Mm-hmm. And we you know I think that the team wanted to bring uh, a game that was going to be able for us to get comfortable with the idea, or at least discuss it better, you know, amongst ourselves or in society, and you know the whole environment as well. Uh, you know, the, a really colorful environment, mm-hmm. uh, a cozy environment where you, where you would feel uh, comfortable and, uh, you know, it's kind of like you're sitting in your living room and there's a fire, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that's warming you up in the winter. And you want to feel when you're playing the game, you want to get like that sort of cozy feeling when you're playing the game. So it's kind of strange because those are, two ideas that don't go well together, you know, feeling comfortable and cozy in the presence of a subject that's so, um, that's so difficult for us to, to talk about Mm -hmm. more often than not. So that's what sparked the idea behind Spirit Fair. So it's kind of a strange way to start a game, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Because usually games, it's like, like you mentioned earlier, it's like, we're very comfortable with the idea of death, but without really thinking about it in the way that we should think about it, that is that we're killing a lot of stuff in games, yeah. but not realizing that we're actually killing things and things are dying and, you know, we're inflicting harm most often, mm-hmm. um, more harm than good. So it's a different approach. And I think that's, that's amazing. I mean, whenever I, you know, I think about working on a project, uh, I wanted to, I want to be able to connect with the project and I want it to be meaningful. Um, and I think more and more the team at Thunder Lotus is taking that direction, you know, me- making beautiful games that are fun, but mm-hmm. making them meaningful as well. Because video games have so much potential to bring, uh, you like players spend so much time uh, playing video games. You have so much time to make them, to put them in a certain, um, in a certain state of mind. 
mm-hmm. and also it has the potential to make you think in a way that maybe movies and other sort of media cannot because you spend so much time playing them because you're invested in them mm-hmm. because you're an active player and because basically you can create you know infinite worlds and stories that you cannot sort of get deep into in other media so that was really interesting for me at the start of the project So yeah, the game basically, if I was to be a bit more um, less um, conceptual and more describe what you actually do in the game is that you play a spirit fair called uh, named Stella. And basically uh, you have uh, you enter a world that's the world in between, let's say, uh, the afterlife and the and normal life, the, the mm-hmm. life of the living. And uh, basically you take on spirits onto your boat and you help them and you take care of them before they move on to the afterlife. And those spirits, there are 11 of them in the game and they all have very different personalities and different needs and all the gameplay is based around caring for them. So as opposed to like uh, shooting different creatures like you would in most games and... In previous Thunder Lotus games, you're actually caring for, for, for other people and mm-hmm. helping them go through certain phases of their lives, and in, in a way, like getting through the various stages of grief. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very beautiful, and there are a number of times where uh, you know just the writing has brought me to tears because it's just a really touching story and a touching experience to take care of these. Uh, they're not people, but I guess people, for lack of a better descriptor, it's it's a it's an amazing experience, and and I, I really would love to just get into the nitty gritty of the music because, um, as I've mentioned, so enjoyable, and and one of the things that I find uh, so beautiful about it is there's a very improvisational feel to a lot of it and I'd love for mm. you to kind of address the that freedom in in the music that is heard so often throughout the soundtrack. Sure. Well, I mean, there's some of it that's, you know, that's that I, that's actually written and composed, and there's Definitely. some of it that's a bit more free free flowing. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any specific examples in mind? Oh, so sure. Maybe more... um, probably the at sea track, really. Yeah, some of those um, woodwind lines come in and they just kind of, they'll just play a little thing and kind of come in and out of the texture. It's really lovely. Okay, so yeah, that's that was a challenge because all the tracks um, that play while you're in, I mean, you can spend a lot of time on the boat. Um, yeah. You know, doing management stuff. So taking care of your friends and building uh, shelters for them, houses, uh, kitchen or a field growing crops and since you can spend a lot of time doing that the music has to be like calming but not too intrusive and not too rep- uh, repetitive mm-hmm. so you can't really have a specific theme um, bombarding you this really specific melody on and on again so the challenge is composing something that's actually um, that has a melody but that but it's it's not sort of it, it doesn't become problematic if it repeats over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And having a more free-flowing form in the music does help the listener uh, be more at ease with that, you know, especially since you're spending so much time on the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that sort of composition happened is just that I started playing the piano. You know, you want to try to keep things simple with things like that, but at the same time, if the music is too simple, it's not as interesting. Right. So you have to add a little bit of complexity and a little bit of movement um, without making it too specific or too having it too much of an earworm. You know, mm-hmm. not something mm-hmm. that repeats itself and that you remember very clearly. So 
Yeah, so I just laid down the piano track and after that starting writing down ideas of counterpoint that could sort of be woven between those notes. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point, uh, the guitar playing was just indeed me uh, sort of improvising with the piano th theme that had been laid down earlier in that track and doing a couple of variations of that and seeing what, you know, felt right. A lot of it was me picking up an instrument and just, you know, trying to write with the flow of what, you know, life on the boat was. So picking up a guitar or the piano, just playing and keeping the parts in the end that felt right. Mm -hmm. um, you play a lot of different instruments, right? Uh, yes, I do. I just, I, I must say, I only play uh, guitar well. <laughs> I'm only a good guitarist, but I can. <laughs> I can play other instruments as well, but, you know, basic playing. I wouldn't okay. consider myself a good piano player, a good woodwinds player, or, mm -hmm. you know. Did you play other instruments on the soundtrack then, personally? Yes. So I played piano, uh, guitar. I did some vocals on it, but when I say vocals, you don't hear that it's actually me. It's just that I'm adding texture in some places. Sure. Uh, let me think. Some percussions... I'm looking around the studio right now and just seeing what I used. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say, yeah, some mandolin, you know, stringed yeah. instruments. There's some really great, you know, uh, flute, all kinds of different types of flute work, transverse flute and uh, yeah. shakuhachi or something along those lines. There's yeah, yeah, great yeah. clarinet too. And um, in, for instance, in the Hummingbird, uh, tr Hummingbird rather, <laughs> Hummingbird yeah. track, yeah. Uh, it's got this like hot club jazz thing going on with the accordion, which I love, and mm -hmm. is very uh, evocative of you know France in the twenties, right? And then yeah, yeah, the, yeah. But there's this beautiful duet with the flute and clarinet that I love. So talk to me about that that one. So yeah, that's interesting because um, the creative director on the game and lead writer uh, uh, Nico Guérin, he's from France. And it's funny because throughout the game, we had discussions about, you know, when you're discussing with the creative director, you're like, you know, you're talking about how something should feel. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that sometimes you have different references. So he, him coming from France, something that was cozy and warm was sitting in a cafe in the summer and listening to, uh, you know, French music band playing on the side of the streets, mm -hmm. which would feature, you know, accordion and mm -hmm. uh, some some manouche guitar and, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I would have had like a totally different reference. But that was interesting because I was like, okay, so let me try to think how I can combine my vision of what this should feel like and yours and see, you know, where we s sort of can blend those together. And we didn't go all the way to like, you know, the French jazz band playing on the street, but we sort of, you know, I ended up taking some ideas from that. So the accordion would be part of it and combining these with like, the orchestra sound and to make that track in the end, Hummingbird. There are different references in the game. It's supposed Hummingburg is sort of to be uh, um, a sort of French-German town. Okay. From, so, you know, those are, those are, uh, which is, you know, do you know a region called Alsace in France? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's supposed to be based on that region. So, so huh. yeah. So we ended up taking like some ideas from different regions of the, of the world, um, some textures and integrating them into some into like what is the sound, what 
what was the general sound of the soundtrack, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of like orchestral textures and stuff like that. So that's why you would hear like more traditional instruments like flutes and clarinets blended with accordion and sometimes shakuhachi and uh, even like in some instances you will hear sitar. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, the sitar with the hoarder guy is pretty great. <laughs> it yeah, always exactly. makes me smile, yeah. <laughs> Um, how much of that were uh, live performances in terms of some of those other really key solo instruments that pop up? Yeah, so um, I always tend to mix uh, a bit of everything. Um, mm-hmm. You know, how much you can live, use live instrument is also based on the budget of the game. Yeah, um, yeah. So I have to k- sort of keep the scale in control considering, you know, Thunder Lotus was uh, a very small studio and mm-hmm. still is, it will probably get a chance to grow, uh, you know, if Spirit Fairy keeps going well. And it, it has been growing in the very quickly in the past year or so. But, you know, the budgets are still, we're still very indie game budgets, you know. So as a composer, I have to be able to adapt to that and mm-hmm. consider that, you know, we can't go, we can't record 90 minutes of music with an orchestra. Right. So I have, I have to sort of know when to use real instruments and when to sort of work with either me playing the instruments. I mean, instead of hiring soloists or ensembles, when am I playing the instrument? When am I using samples? Um, and in the end, so I tend to mix a lot of stuff. I mix samples, I mix, I mix live performances. Uh, so we had some real instruments, like uh, we had you know, some harmonica, some strings, some violin. I was playing guitar, I was playing piano. Um, and a lot of the instruments I named before, and we had to blend all that with sample performances of, you know, larger orchestral ensembles as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, But since you're, you know, blending everything, you sort of still get a live feel in the end if you use it correctly. It takes a lot more time, you know. I'd like to be able to just write the notes down and send it to an orchestra because it it sounds it sounds great and it doesn't take as much time as spending hours and hours on a simple, you know, string melody line. But... You know, in the end, you, you, in the end, the the music is the, um, you know, the emotion you're able to bring out is the most important thing. If the emotion comes through, and the performance, you know, the the performance is good, the emotion is there, and the music really, if if it's music that you're really able to connect with, that's the importance. So, I mean, no matter the budget, we're always able to arrive to a result that you know, mm-hmm. ends mm-hmm. up bringing out the emotion and working in favor of, um, of the game. I'd love to speak more about some of these duets that that happen, and I didn't know if it was deliberate that you had a lot of these really nice little duets laced around, or if it yeah. just was a happy accident. Can you talk to me about that? So, when you're saying duets, you're saying when there's. Could you sp- uh, refer to a yeah. specific example? I sure can. So, like, there's the one at the end of Hummingbird, the track with the flute and the clarinet that I absolutely love. Yep. Um, there's one with flutes in, and I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, but Guranu Fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Knight has a duet between piano and flute. I mean, and there's there's more. No. So, I mean, you know, maybe it was just happy accident, but I love all of it. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, well, I'm I'm really happy that you you like those, and those are actually sampled instruments. Nice. Yeah. So, so I mean, so you, you fooled me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, but exactly. But it 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 takes a lot of work. So yeah. Uh, what I what I do to make it sound, you know, interesting, and to have the movement movement right, and to be able to really bring out like the quality of the, the instruments, even though those are sta static sample performances, is that I play everything. So instead of programming it as you know you would in some instances on the computer, I just play them on the, the keyboard mm. and try to articulate performances as much as possible with the samples. And um, that sort of brings a live feel to it. In some mm. instances, I so like some of them... You know, if I have like one sampled instrument, I'll have another one that's real. But in the two cases that you named, those are both samples. Wow. If you're going to be recording live instruments, um, eventually, you just play the notes and make it sound like decent, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want the final, I, I have a hard time uh, doing that. I have a hard time sending something to the studio and it not being perfect or not sounding good. So what, what happens is that I put a lot, a lot of energy into uh, my demos. And in the end, you know, the, the problem is like often like people will fall in love with those demos and don't see the need <laughs> to record real instruments, right? Sure. So, so that's, you know, that's something else. But um, yeah, I just like, I just like, even when I'm working with samples, I like them to feel real and to bring out as much, uh, emotion as I can from those sample performances. Yeah, wow. Um, one of the other things I noticed too is there's, there's some use of Dorian mode. Yeah, and Mixolydian. Yeah. Mixolydian, I think I've used, yeah. Yes, so you use Dorian and Mixolydian, and I loved that yeah. because they both have that flat seven, and so there was this consistency yeah. there, and, and I'd love to hear you talk about that. That's very interesting. I don't know if I can elaborate uh, on that, though. It just... Um, so I'm not I'm not classically trained. I'm not even trained in jazz. So I I understand uh, basic music theory, and I used to be able to read well when I was little and I was learning flute and a little bit of guitar, guitar at first. But I sort of lost that skill with time. So although I understand what's happening on a score, although it would be super super slow for me to write music. Uh, uh, with pen and paper on yeah. a traditional score mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I'm, I just haven't practiced that skill through the years. Yeah. So when we're talking about music theory, um, although I understand your question, I wouldn't be able to elaborate on a specific reason why I chose to do that other than it felt right. Yeah. So I was talking to someone else uh, working on the game who's also a mus musician, the team, uh, the, who's a sound, uh, Eric, who's a sound designer on the game. Mm -hmm. And I was like, he was asking me the scale I was using uh, because he wanted to do sounds that would fit into that scale. Sure. Uh, and I was like, well, I'm using this scale. I think it's either this or that, I think, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And he actually told me that it was Mixolydian. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's why I was able to tell you because I don't, I don't think of music that way. Although I might, in some instances, know which scale I'm in, mm -hmm. um, I don't tend to reflect too much on the, th the theory of it. I sure. just sort of go with what feels right. But yeah, there are practical choices sometimes because you need to, you need all the game to be in the same scale, um, you know, for compatibility mm -hmm. uh, concerns yeah. throughout the game. So I would tend to like practically have discussions about that and reflect on that. But, you know, to answer your questions, I, I guess it just felt right. themes that you wrote worked really well to be moved around and stuff. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, maybe I can answer this question and answer the previous question as well. Um, I think when you're dealing with a subject that's, there's a lot of ambiguity in death. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of ambiguity in various types of emotions involved when you're trying to discuss death in a way that's not dr- too dramatic, you know, in a way that's sort of close and warm and, you know, the, the way they wanted to pr- portray death in the game, but that doesn't make it always happy or always sad, you know, there's, there's a lot of emotions in between and the complexity of those emotions cannot be summarized by just using like a major scale or a minor scale or right. there's a lot of you know gray areas in that and maybe using a scale that's a little bit in between sometimes allows us to work in more complex ideas maybe into the music um, and that's definitely a challenge uh, we're talking about really complex concepts and ideas sometimes that require a lot of nuance and sometimes the music has to portray that um, so it's definitely a challenge finding melodies that were able to that you were able to twist and turn in every sort of situation to fit the current mood yeah. um, maybe like not using straight up normal scales that we associate we have you know as human beings we come with a whole well with a whole baggage of influences um, yes. so if we're we're hearing dissonant chords you know, um, diminished chords, we associate that with a certain feeling. So it's hard to dissociate everyone from those associations that they've made throughout their lives. You know, film has been presenting you a certain idea of what this kind of music means, Mm -hmm. video games as well, or, you know, popular culture. Yes. So you sort of have to work within that, those parameters and still have some sort of complexity, uh, in some instances to say, you know, this is not not only a scary moment, it's also a moment, you know, of um, of reflection. This is not only a happy moment, there's also nostalgia in it. And there's also, you know, vast array of emotions and of complexity. And, you know, it's, it's not always easy to portray that in the music. And using, you know, different scales or stuff that's not, I would say, like first degree music can help sometimes. <laughs> you know, like having a passage in the same piece that's like, you know, in the first sentence or in the first four bars or eight bars or 16 bars, I was saying this, I was saying, wow, this is a joyful moment, but oh, what about these 16 bars? They're saying something else. Having those nuances in the soundtrack definitely help to address the complexity sometimes of the themes. track Oxbury, for instance. Is that a sample yes. too, the, the little jazzy trumpet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Oxbury is supposed to be Montreal. Oh, fun. Okay. And for the music, so I had an idea of maybe what the music we could write for that, but Nico had a bit of a different take on it because his perspective was as, um, well, what he told me was like when he first arrived in Montreal, the feeling he had for Oxbury was sort of this bluesy, almost Southern feel. It's strange because we had totally, we had different references, right? Like my references as being, I was born here. Mm. So I had a bit of an idea of what Montreal was supposed to sound like, but for him it was completely different. Yeah. And I thought, I thought it was interesting to go his way and integrate those influences. The trumpet is just like when you're walking in the streets of, uh, of Montreal in the summer, in a normal summer, you have jazz music everywhere during the month of July because it's a jazz festival. Yes. And you hear those instruments reflecting, uh, you know, reverberate, reverberating through the, the downtown area. And a lot of time it involves, you know, jazz instruments. It involve, you know, a solo trumpet player or, you know, someone playing saxophone and you hear it reverberating through the streets. And so the idea of having an instrument like that was very important. Um, the problem arrived that in, during the production, uh, uh, I wrote Oxbury, I think, in the middle of the COVID um, pandemic, you know, the peak of the pandemic here in Montreal, Canada. 
And I had to find ways to, to work around that. So I started collaborating with a few people uh, remotely because I didn't have access. You know, the, the people that I usually work with, they come in the studio. Right. And we record together, the soloist. But they didn't have necessarily have a remote recording setup the people that I tend to work with. Mm-hmm. So I have to I had to find people that I was not used to record with and um you know a lot of those people I was looking through YouTube and finding people to collaborate with and f- with some of them it worked and with others it you know it became a challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh because when you're with the uh, player in the same room you can sort of you know give him notes and really adjust the por- performance in real time and a lot of stuff comes out that you can explain in person that's really harder to explain when you're at a distance. Yeah. And in the end, it was like um, the reason I ended up using a lot of sample instruments uh, for late in the production was because of that. Finding collaborators proved a little bit more difficult in uh, April and May 2020 than it used to be before. Yeah. So we had to adjust to that. So how long were you working on the score, Max? I think I wrote the first theme suite, which became the track Spirit Fairy on the soundtrack called the, the tracks, the self-titled track. Uh, I think it was winter 2018. Okay. Uh, during that winter, I wrote a, a few cues for the game. Um, you know, it was, it was still early in the production process. And then I think I wrote part-time until... Uh, August 2020, like a week before the game was released. So it was around two years of part-time writing for the game. If we can just move uh, on to some other projects just for a moment, um, y- you know, clearly you wrote two other scores for Thunder Lotus games, and and they're very very different than Spirit Fair. Do you want to just briefly talk about those experiences? Uh, yeah. So, what can I say? I mean, uh, Jotun, the the first game the the studio did was it was an absolute thrill to work on that game because um, it was the first opportunity for me. Uh, to write music that was like full-blown orchestral music yeah, and to try my hand th- at that because otherwise you don't really, unless you're working on, you know, uh, animation films or big Hollywood pictures, um, there's only really like, uh, you know, indie video games, like for me that was accessible at the time where I could try my hand at write, writing music like that, yeah. that could in sort of way justify the scale. And now, you know, the studio wanted to produce... Uh, you know, this epic tale about Thora, a Viking warrior that has to battle giants in uh, purgatory to be able to to make her way to Valhalla. So, you know, that sounded epic enough and the idea of writing, you know, large-scale music for that was was thrilling. So I had a lot of fun making uh, music for that game. And for Sundered, I mean, it was a completely different game. It was um, sort of dystopian, um, Lovecraftian horror story where you play a character that descends into like this sort of madness-filled universe where you battle, you know, very horrifying creatures. And, you know, sort of it, it was it was a blend between sort of an action sci fi game and a horror game. And it was a completely different experience. I say it was, I'm really happy with the music I wrote for the game, but it was a much harder process than anything I've written before mm. because you're always in this sort of dark state of mind when you're yeah, writing. Sure. And spending, you know, hours and hours and weeks and months writing that kind of music for me was 
uh, I had to get in that state of mind and staying that state of mind for so long was a bit difficult, I must admit. Oh, I know yeah. some some people are thrilled with, you know, spending a lot of time in the horror yeah. genre and world, but for me it was it was a challenge. I mean, I love the experience. I'm I'm happy with the music I wrote for that, but mm-hmm. staying in that state of mind, I was not able to remove myself from it, you know, and look at it from a from a distance like some people are able to do like, you know, mm-hmm. oh, horror is so cool. For me it was like what comes out of me I'm, my state of mind is based on the music I'm writing at the time in a way because I pour yeah. everything into it so sure. yeah that was a different experience Also, have made a film. Is that correct? Yes. So, um, having spent so many time uh, abroad since 2010 and witnessing realities that we thought were that we learned a lot from and that were fascinating to us, my partner and I, uh, we decided to start making uh, documentary films. And we shot our first documentary uh, almost accidentally in 2014. While we, tra- while we were traveling in uh, Tajikistan, which is a small country neighboring China and Afghanistan. And it was about a botanist that built his own hydroelectric system to help his family survive through uh, the post-USSR crisis. Um, uh, you know, the, the country Tajikistan, it fell into a, a very precarious state of famine after uh, the USSR got dismantled. And, you know, to help his family, he built a a very small hydroelectric system out of a very small water supply he had in a mountain close to his home. And that was a fascinating story to us. He's a very interesting character. And we decided to to make a film out of it. And the film did very well in festivals uh, around the world. And it sort of sparked the idea of, you know, making more projects like these. So we have two projects in production right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, one that's in, that we shot in Nepal in 2018 and another one that we shot, uh, well, through 2018 and 2019 and 2020 in India. And we're, we're, we're working hard on those. Yeah. My goodness, yeah, that's incredible. So absolutely nothing to do with music, but I imagine you make the music for them? Yes, uh, the sound and the music. Um, and the idea, you know, like I think... Uh, making music is very fulfilling, but at some point there are a lot of things that you want to say that you can't necessarily say through on, through music only. Mm-hmm. So the idea of doing film and documentary is is to be able to discuss issues and topics that you know you can't really discuss through making. You know, m- music is you know can convey a lot of stuff, but some more complex social ideas sometimes it's more difficult to to portray or to to discuss, especially through instrumental music. Yeah. So that's the making film is a lot more efficient in that way. Well, first of all, are you in any bands anymore? I mean, I know COVID would have messed that up anyway, but do you do you perform anymore in that way? I don't play in bands anymore, but um, whenever I release an album, I try to do like a launch party and have a live show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I tend to partner with musicians for an event like that. The last time though that I did that was in 2018 uh, for an album that I released called Golestan, um, which is, was about a lot of things that I which was inspired from my travels in Iran uh, okay. that I did like a few years back. Wow. So I put together a small set for that and I will likely do so again in the future uh, if I release another, if I, get, if I get the time to make another album, solo album. So we'll see. I mean, who knows what the future holds? I mean, right now there's there's no certainty, but I'd love to play live again. Spirit Fair comes 
at a you know at a good time I think because we're facing something that is unprecedented and that's taken a toll on a lot of people and having a game that you can play and sort of um, that approaches the idea of death and grief and also of care, the aspect of care and compassion in a way that um, not a lot of games do. Well, there are some of them, but I feel like for me working on this project changed the way I feel about games because I feel they can bring much more that we uh, allow them to most of the time. Like a game is actually a place where you can uh, reconcile certain things about your own life and learn things about yourself, but also uh, you know, seeing how people have reacted to the, to the game, it, it seemed to have helped a lot of people um, come at ease with certain situation with their family, their friends, whether it's grief or differences. So I think it comes at the right time to have a game like that at a moment where we need that kind of emotions and to encourage uh, compassion and care in our society or, you know, in our personal lives as well. I mean, it's like an absolutely beautiful game uh, in every regard. The writing is beautiful. The visuals, the hand-painted animation is beautiful. The music is beautiful. And uh, I'm just so happy for it. And Max, really just great job. And, and thanks so much for talking with me. Well, thank you, Emily. Thanks for getting in touch. Thanks for listening to Level with Emily Reese. You can learn more about Max LL at patreon.com slash level. I'm Emily Reese. Sam Heenan is our producer. Say hi, Sam. Hi. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Level with Emily and learn more about us at levelwithemily.com, made possible by Adam Selvage at Tiki Web Services and composer Brad Gentle. Level with Emily Reese is a production of June Media, Inc.